Good morning, everybody. This is the Macro Church of Christ Wednesday Samuel Chronicle study. We're in 2 Chronicles chapter 25 and verse 13. Before we get started, we're going to have Chad lead us in a prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we're thankful to be here this morning and to study your word. We ask that you be with all those mentioned that are feeling well, that your, your hand will be upon them, and that if it's your will to bring them back to better health. We're thankful for your son, Jesus. And we ask that you be with us as we go through this study. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. All right, so we are in 2 Kings chapter 25 and verse 13 is where we're at. We're going to be covering this section. You might say, well, there's not very much in here. It's the, the chapter 25 only, go, only goes down to, to verse 30. But the thing is that we have a lot of background material that I want to cover with you from the book of Jeremiah because what we have going on in this section here, if you remember, the... Uh, um, Babylonians had come, and they had. Oh, stop! Wrong one. What happened here? Try this again. Why are you doing that on me? Okay. Oh well, that's fine. All right. Okay. Uh, if you remember, we're in this section right here that deals with. Uh, Zedekiah and these guys that are here. We're looking at the rule of Zedekiah. Remember that Zedekiah had been put into power by uh, Babylon. And uh, Zedekiah, in our last lesson, had been resisting Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar had been sieging the place. And after 18 months, he broke in and he killed Zedekiah. And then he put some other people in charge. And that's really where we're at here in 2 Kings 25. There's a little bit of reading we're going to do here. And then we're going to look at some things that are over here in, um, in um, Jeremiah. And so if you go there with me, not to Jeremiah, but if you go, if you go to 2, Chronic, 2 Kings 25, verse 12 says, But the captain of the body of the guard left some of the poorest of the land to be vine dressers and plowmen. Now the bronze pillars, which were in the house of the Lord, and the, and the stands in the bronze sea, which were in the house of the Lord, the Chaldeans broke in pieces and carried uh, the bronze to Babylon. They took away the pots and the, sh and the shovels and snuffers and spoons and all the bronze vessels which, which were used in the temple service. The captain of the guard also took away the fire pans and the basins, uh, what was fine gold, and what was fine silver, and the two pillars, the sea and the stands which Solomon had made for the house of the Lord, the bronze of all these vessels was beyond height or beyond weight. The height of the one pillar was eighteen cubits, and a bronze capital was on it. And the height of the of the capital was three cubits, with a network and a pomegranates on the capital all around, all of bronze. And the second pillar was like these with, with networks. Then the captain of the guard took uh, Shariah, the chief priest, and uh, Zephaniah, the second priest, uh, with the three officers of the temple from the, from the city. He took one uh, official who was, over, who was overseer of the men of war and five of the king's adv advisors who were found in the city and the, scribe of the and the scribe of the captain of the army who mustered the people of the land and 60 men of the people of the land who were found in the city. Nebu uh, Nebuzardan, the captain of the guard, took them and brought them to the king of Babylon in Riblah. And the king of Babylon struck them down and put them to death at Riblah in the, in the land of Hamath. So Judah was led away into exile from its land. And so basically what you have is you have the, the little recording or uh, recorded for us that when Nebuchadnezzar came over here and took Zedekiah captive, that he also took with him all the bronze and all the things of value. So basically anything that was metal and anything that was valuable, he took with him and he, uh, for the purpose of being able to, to use it, of course. So he took the gold, he took the silver, he took the, the bronze um, uh, pillars that were in, in front of the, the temple uh, with their capitals and with everything. And he took it because, of course, that's one of the ways that you pay for your war is you take all the spoil of the land. 
Uh, and then he took basically the, the men who were left in the city, because you remember it took him 18 months to get into the city to break in. And so the, the individuals that were in there that were basically the leaders, he then took and he killed. And uh, it says in verse 21, and then the king of Babylon struck them down and put them to death to Rib uh, at Riblah in the land of Hamath. So Judah was led away into exile from its land. And so now you have Judah left there. And, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, you have um, uh, the poorest of the people left there. All the people were taken captive, and uh, they were taken away. But he did leave, however, some of the poorest people there. In verse 22, it says, Now as for the people who were left in the land of Judah, whom uh, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had left, he appointed Gedaliah, the son of Ahiakim, the son of Shaphan, over them. And so you have, even though that everybody's taken away and the city basically is destroyed, the temple's destroyed, there were still people left in the city. And so Nebuchadnezzar put this guy named Gedaliah in uh, their place. Now, in second, in uh, Jeremiah 39, I want you to go with me to Jeremiah 39. And matter of fact, you might kind of hold your finger in Jeremiah or put a little marker there so you can kind of read along with us in various places. But notice that Jeremiah 39, verse 1, is basically talking about the fall of, of Jerusalem. As, as he's talking about the fall of Jerusalem, uh, down here at about verse um, 14, it says, They even sent and took Jeremiah out of the court of the guardhouse and entrusted him to get Eliah, the, the son of Ahiakim, the son of Saphan, to take him home, so he stayed among the people. So Jeremiah was allowed to stay in the land, and he was given over to this fellow who was named uh, Gedaliah, and he was taken from the guardhouse. In other words, he had been, if you remember during Zedekiah's rule, Jeremiah came and preached to him, and Jeremiah took him and put him in a pit and, because he didn't like what he was, what he was preaching. And so he put, him in, he put him in a pit and was leaving him there until the, one of the Ethiopian officials came and actually delivered him out of the pit. Uh, and so he, remember, uh, what, was, what was Jeremiah telling the people that they should do during this time? Well, repent, no, but something else. They should surrender. They should surrender to the Chaldeans that had encircled the city. If you surrender, you'll get to live, right? That's the reason why Zedekiah stuck him in the pit, because he was basically uh, causing the people to lose their, their morale when he's talking to them about the fact that there's, that there's supposed to be individuals who have left, uh, or, or the people who are left, should go and surrender. And of course, when you're in the middle of a war, you don't want, pe you don't want people hearing that. And so, therefore, that's the reason that he had um, done that to him and put him, put him in, that in that prison. But he came out, and he stayed with Gedaliah. And so uh, Gedaliah was the guy he stayed with. Now, verse 15 of Jeremiah 39 says, Now the word of the Lord had come to Jeremiah while he was confined in the court of the guard's house, saying, Go and speak to Ebba Melech, uh, the Ethiopian. This is the guy who pulled him out when he was in the pit saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I am about to bring my word on this city for disaster and not for prosperity, and they, will, and they will take place before you on that day. But I will deliver you in the, uh, in that, on that day, declares the Lord, and you will not be given into the hand of the men whom you dread. For I will certainly rescue you, and you will not fall by the sword, but you will have your, your own life as booty, because you have trusted in me, declares the Lord. And that's the Ethiopian that helped um, uh, Jeremiah when he was in the pit because Zedekiah had put him there. And, and so that's who, this, that's who this Gedaliah is, okay? He was, he was somebody who was in, in the uh, court of, of uh, Zedekiah. And, and uh, as a result of that, they put him in charge of the people who were left, okay? Now, back to 2 Kings 25. Verse 23 says, When all the captains of the forces, they and their men, heard that the king of Babylon had appointed Gedaliah governor, they came to get, to get Eliah to Mizpah, namely Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and 
Joannan, uh, the son of Karia, and Shariah, the son of Tanhumeth, and Netaphathiah, the Jezanith, the son of Makathite, uh, they and their men. Okay? And Gedaliah is telling them, swear uh, to me uh, and their men, uh, and, se uh, and said to them, do not be afraid of the servants of the Chaldeans. Live in the land and serve the king of Babylon, and it will be well with you. So basically what happened was Gedaliah uh, uh, is appointed ruler or king over the people that are left there, and um, the people that are left, the people that were scattered and the army that was scattered, they heard that he was put in, in power, and so they all come and they gather around him, and basically he then becomes their, their ruler or their leader. Now, I want you to go with me to Jeremiah chapter 40. And in Jeremiah chapter 40, we're going to notice that we have the story of what happens with the people who remained in Judah. And as he does that, in verse 1 of Jeremiah 40, he says, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord after Nebuchadnezzar, captain, I'm sorry, after Nebuchadnezzar, captain of the bodyguard, had, re had released him from Ramah, when he had taken him bound in chains among all the exiles of Jerusalem and Judah who were being exiled to Babylon. Now the captain of the bodyguard had taken Jeremiah and said to him, The Lord your God promised this calamity against this place, and the Lord has brought it on and done just as he promised. Because, because you people sinned against the Lord and did not listen to his voice, therefore this thing has happened to you. But now... Behold, I am freeing you today from the chains which are on, on your hands. If you, uh, if you would prefer to come with me to Babylon, come along, and I will look after you. But if you would prefer not to come with me to Babylon, never mind. Look to the whole land is before you. Go wherever it seems good and right for you to go. As Jeremiah was still not, not going back, uh, he said, Go on back then to Gedaliah, the son of uh, ha uh, Hikam, the son of Shaphan, whom the king of Babylon has appointed over the cities of Judah, and stay with him among the people, or else go anywhere it seems right for you to go. So the captain of the bodyguard gave him a ration and a gift and let him go. So basically, Jeremiah was freed. He's, the captain said, you can go wherever you want to. And he gave, he gave him a ration, and he said, you can either go with me back to Jerusalem, I mean back to Babylon, or you can stay here. Now, remember that Ezekiel over here was taken to Babylon. Ezekiel was in Babylon, and so Ezekiel's message and the, the message of Ezekiel, the prophecies of Ezekiel, were written from the perspective of being in Babylon. And here we have Jeremiah, who's writing from the perspective of being in Judah and remaining there after everybody had been, had been taken captive. Uh, and then it says uh, in verse 25, But it came about in the seventh month that Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, the son of uh, uh, Elishim of the royal family came with ten men and struck Gedaliah down so that he died along with the Jews and the Chaldeans who were with him at Mizpah. Then all the people, both, both small and great, and the captain of the forces arose and went to Egypt, for they were afraid of the Chaldeans. Now, a bunch of stuff goes on in between here, but that's a summary, that's a summary of what happens in just a minute that we're, that we're going to be looking at here and, and, and noticing what happens. So basically, if you remember back over in, in Kings over here that we were looking, it said that Gedaliah was made king, and then all these people who were left in the land, they came for the purpose of being able to uh, uh, have him be ruler over them, and he was ruler over, he was ruler over all the cities that were there. And, and this guy, Ishmael, comes along and basically kills him. Now, if you come over here to, to um, Jeremiah, and you come over here to chapter believe it's chapter, yeah, chapter 41. Yeah. 
It says, in the seventh month, Ishmael, the son of uh, Nethaniah, the son of uh, Eliashim, of the royal family, and one of the chief officers of the king, along with ten men, came to Mizpah to, uh, to get Eliah, the son of uh, Hikam, while they were eating bread together there at Mizpah. And Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and the ten men who were with him, arose and struck down Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, with the sword, and put to death the one whom the king of Babylon had appointed over the land. So there's Ishmael coming and basically having a coup and killing him, uh, killing Gedaliah. Uh, and it says, uh, and, Ish, uh, and Ishmael struck down all the Jews who were with him, that is, with Gedaliah at Mizpah and the Chaldeans who were found there, the men of war. So not only did Nebuchadnezzar leave uh, Gedaliah there and some of the people, but he also left a few of his officers there just to kind of oversee what was going on. And Ishmael came, and not only did he kill Gedaliah, but he killed all of the Chaldeans. And so now there's, there's this fear of the fact that they are going to be um, uh, killed. And so in verse 5 it says... Uh, that um, let's see. Now, verse four. It says, "Now it happened on the next day after the king of Gedaliah, uh, after the killing of Gedaliah, when no one knew about it, that eighty men came from Shechem, from Shiloh, and from Samaria, with their beards shaved off and their clothes torn and their bodies gashed, having grain offerings and incense in their hands to bring to the house of the Lord." In other, in other words, the, these are individuals that are coming that because the, the uh, uh, city had been destroyed, these individuals were coming and they were basically going to offer a sacrifice. Uh, and that's, that's the idea of why they were mourning and they were, they were bringing this sacrifice because they hadn't understood everything that happened yet uh, at that time. And so it says, when the captain of the force, uh, I'm sorry, um, then verse 6 says, Then Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, went out from Mizpah to meet them, weeping as he went. In other words, he was, he was like, I'm mourning too over what's going on, over the fact that Jerusalem has been taken captive and the city's been destroyed and the temple's been destroyed. And so he's acting like, oh, yeah, I'm really bothered by it too. He says, weeping as he went. And as he met them, he said to them, Come to, to, to get Eliah, the son of Ahikam. Yet it turned out, that as soon as they came inside the city, Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and the men who were with him, uh, slaughtered them and cast them in, uh, into a cistern. And so basically, this, this Ishmael was basically killing everybody that was for, for Gedaliah and was basically going to take over what was going on. Uh, in, verse, in verse 8, it says... Um, but the ten men who were found, uh, but uh, but ten men who were found among them said to Ishmael, "Do not put us to death, for we have stores stores of wheat, barley, and oil and honey hidden in the field." So he refrained and did not put them to death, along with their companions. Now, as for the cistern where Ish, uh, Ishmael had cast all the corpses of the, of the men whom he had struck down because of Gedaliah, it was. The, the one that King Asa had made on account of uh, uh, Basha, king of Israel, and Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, filled it with the slain. And so here again, you have the fact that Israel, or at least the people that are left in Israel, haven't learned their lesson about killing innocent people. They're, they're still just on their own. They're doing whatever they, whatever they, they want to do, and they're not submitting themselves to God. Remember, God had told them that if you stay in the land there and if you stay and submit to the king of Babylon, you'll live and you'll, you'll, God will take care of you. Okay, now, in verse 10 it says, Then Ishmael took captive all the remnant of the people who were in Mizpah, the king's daughters, and all the people who were left in Mizpah, whom, Nebuchadnez whom Nebuz uh, Nebuzardan, the captain of the bodyguard, had put under the charge of Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam. Thus Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, took them captive and proceeded to cross over to the sons of Ammon. So basically, he kidnapped all the people that were left uh, in that city, and he was going to take them with him over to Am uh, Ammon. But there was a guy named uh, 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 Jonan, or Jonan, in verse 11, that was going to do something about this. He says, But Jonan, the son of uh, Kariah, and all the commanders of the, of the forces that were with him, heard of all the evil that Ishmael, the son of Nethan, uh, uh, 
Nethaniah had done. So they took all the men and went to fight with Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, and they found him by the great pool that is in, in Gibeon. Okay, now, uh, uh, whoops, now, sorry, lost my place here. Now, as soon as all the people who were with Ishmael saw Johanan, the son of Korea, and the, and the commander of the forces that were with him, they were glad. So all the people whom Ishmael had taken captive from Mizpah turned around and came back and went to uh, Jonan, the son of Korea. But Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, escaped from uh, Jonan uh, uh, with uh, eight men and went to the sons of Ammon. So he escapes. And so now uh, Jonan is now the, the uh, you might say, the, the leader of, of, who's going, of what's going on there. Verse 16 says, Then Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the commanders of the forces that were with him, took, Mizpah, uh, uh, took from Mizpah all the remnant of the people whom he had recovered from Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, after he had struck down Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, that is, the, the men who were soldiers, the women, the children, and the eunuchs, whom he had brought back from uh, Gibeon. They, and, and they went and stayed in uh, Geruth, uh, Chimaha, Chimaham, uh, which is beside Bethlehem, in order to proceed to Egypt because of the Chaldeans, for they were afraid of them, since Ishmael, the son of Nathaniah, had struck down Gile, uh, uh, Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, whom the king of Babylon had appointed over the land. So now you have these individuals, and what they want to do is they want to go to Egypt. And the reason they want to go to Egypt is because they were afraid of the Chaldeans, because Ishmael had killed all, uh, had killed Gedaliah and all of the Babylonian soldiers that were there, and they were afraid that when Babylon heard about it, that Babylon would again come and destroy them, and so now they want to go to Egypt. And, and, that, and that's what they want to do. Now, coming back over here to uh, 2 Kings, and down here at verse 25, 2 Kings 25, 25, it says, But it came about in the seventh month that Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, the son of uh, Elishaham, of the royal family, came with ten men and struck Gedaliah down so that he died, along with the Jews and the Chaldeans who were with him at Mizpah. So now you have the rest of the story that, go, that goes al along with that. And then it says, Then all the people, both small and great, and the captain of the forces arose and went to Egypt. So now we're going to learn how and why it is that they go to Egypt. They're going to Egypt because uh, Jonan had uh, uh, become basically the ruler, and they're afraid of what's going to happen. Okay, so... Remember that Jeremiah is there with them, right? Now, chapter 42 and verse 1 of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 42, verse 1. It says, And all the commanders of the forces of Johanan, the son of Korea, uh, uh, Jezaniah, the son of Hosea, and all the people, both small and great, approached and said to Jeremiah the prophet, Please let our petition come before you, and pray for us to the Lord your God, that uh, that is for uh, all this remnant, because we are left, but a few uh, out of many, as your own eyes now see us. So basically, they're going to go to Jeremiah, and they're going to ask Jeremiah to talk to God and find out uh, and find out what God wants them to do. Now, verse three says, "Then the Lord, then the Lord, uh, your God, may tell us the way in which we should walk and the things that we should do." So now all of a sudden, they're getting religious. Now all of a sudden, they say, all right, Jeremiah, talk to God, and, and uh, we want to know what God wants us to do. And, and um, of course, the idea is that we want to know what God wants to do so we can do it, uh, because we're, we're, now going, we're now going to you know, serve him, you might say. So verse 4, it says, Then Jeremiah the prophet said to them, I have heard you. Behold, I am going to pray to the Lord your God in accordance with your words, and I will tell you the whole message which the Lord will answer you. I will not keep back a word from you. Then they said to Jeremiah, May the Lord be a true and faithful witness against us if we do not act in accordance with the whole message with which the Lord your God will send you, uh, will send you to us. So, 
They said, whatever the Lord says, we'll do. I mean, isn't that the way it's supposed to be? If God says something, whatever he says, we'll do. And that's what they said. Whatever God says, we'll go ahead and do uh, because, you know, he's God. Now, verse 6, it says, whether it is pleasant or unpleasant, we will listen to the voice of the Lord our God to whom we are sending you so that it may go, go well with us when we listen to the voice of the Lord our God. So they say, we want to do what God says, so it'll go well with us. Look at all of the stuff that's happened to these people who haven't been doing what God said. And so the, the, they seem real sincere. They seem like they're really interested in doing what God says. And so they want Jeremiah to talk to God. Now, verse 7. Now, at the end of 10 days, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Now, uh, a lot of people are like this. And by that, I mean a, a lot of people say, well, I'll do whatever God says. You know, I, 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 I want to please God. Sometimes it takes God a while to answer us, okay? It took 10 days in this case. You, you might say, well, why didn't God answer them immediately? Well, God has his plans, and, and God answers us according to when we need to be answered. And no doubt there's other things going on during these 10 days that we don't hear about. But nonetheless, it took 10 days, and so the Lord answers him. So Jeremiah calls for the people. Verse 8, he says, Then he called for uh, Johanan, the son of uh, Korea, and all the commanders of the forces that were with him, and for all the people, both small and great. So he calls everybody. He just doesn't call the leaders. He wants everybody to know what God says. Because what we need to understand is, even if the leaders don't do what God says, the people are supposed to do what God says. Just because your leader doesn't do what God says doesn't give you the right not to do what God says. So he calls everybody uh, 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 in order for them to, to know uh, what to do. Now, verse 9, and said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, to whom you sent me to, to, uh, to present your petition before him. If you will indeed stay in this land, then I will build you up and not tear you down, and I will plant you and not uproot you, for I will, for I will relent concerning the calamity that I have inflicted on you. Do not be afraid of the king of Babylon, whom you are now fearing. Do not be afraid of him, declares the Lord, for I am with you, to save you and deliver you from his hand. I will also show you compassion so that he will have compassion on you and restore you to your own soil. But if you are going to say, we will not stay in the land so as not to listen to the voice of the Lord your God, saying, no, but we will go to the land of Egypt where we will uh, not see war or hear the sound of a trumpet or hunger for bread, and we will stay there. Then, in that case, listen to the word of the Lord, O remnant of Judah. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, if you really set your mind to enter Egypt and go uh, in to reside there, then the sword which you are afraid of will overtake you there in the land of Egypt, and the famine about which you are anxious will follow closely after you there in Egypt, and you will die there. So, that's the answer. The answer is, if you stay here in, if you stay here in, in Jerusalem or in Judea, God will bless you. God will take care of you. He, he will relent from the calamity that was supposed to happen if you stay there and be faithful. Now, of course, what are they afraid of? They're, they're afraid of the Chaldeans. They're afraid that when the Chaldeans find out that they're going to come and kill them and that they're going to mistreat them, but God says, don't be afraid of the Chaldeans. Matter of fact, if you stay there and you're faithful to me, I'll give you compassion in the sight of the Chaldeans, and they'll even give you back your own land. You'll get to go live in your own land and in your own place. Okay? Now, so you have these individuals that are afraid of the Chaldeans, and you have God telling them what they're supposed to do, uh, and that is they're supposed to stay. Then he also warns them, if you go to Egypt, because they're thinking that if they go to Egypt, Egypt will be able to defend them because Egypt was also this world power at this time. You remember that, that uh, Egypt and Babylon had that fight up here when, when um, uh, 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 Josiah had gone up there and he was killed because Egypt was on his way up to fight uh, uh, with, uh, 
with um, Syria and, and uh, wanted to, or us Syria, and wanted to fight against Babylon, uh, but uh, they were defeated and they came down. And so uh, the people here with uh, Johanan, they're thinking, well, if nothing else, we'll leave here and we'll go to Egypt and we'll live in Egypt and they'll be able to protect us. But God says, if you go there, what's going to happen? You're going to die there. You're going to die there. Now, we all die, right? But when he says you're going to die there, he doesn't mean you're going to die of old age there. What he means is you're going to die of what you're afraid of. You're going to die of the, the Chaldeans are going to come down and kill you. That's what they're afraid of. That's why they're leaving or, or they want to leave uh, Judah and go down to Egypt because they're afraid that they're going to die in that terrible way. And God says, well, if you go to Egypt, that's exactly what's going to happen to you. Now, they might think it's a good idea. It might seem logical. It might seem like we will get more protection because we're now in a, in a country that doesn't have any defenses. Our army's gone. Our wall cities are gone. Our religion, our religion has been destroyed. There's nothing here to protect us. There's nothing here to take care of us. But if we go to Egypt, they have an army. They have wall cities. They have, you know, everything that, that, can, that they, can, uh, they can take care of us. You know, it, it'll, be, it'll be great if we go down there. Uh, and, and they'll be able to, to help us if we do that. Now, down here at verse 17. Oh, there I am. Yep. Thank you. Down here at verse 17 of Jeremiah 42. So that's what Jeremiah told him. Now verse 17. So all the men who set their minds to go to Egypt to reside there will die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence, and they will, uh, and they will have no survivors or refugees from the from the calamity that I am going to bring on them. For the, for thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, as my anger and my wrath have been poured out on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so my wrath will be poured out on you when you enter Egypt, and you will become a curse and an object of horror and, and uh, an imprecation and a reproach, and you will see this place no more. The Lord has spoken to you, O remnant of Judah. Do not go to Egypt. You should, you should uh, clearly understand that today I have testified against you. For you have only deceived yourselves. For it is you who sent me to the Lord, your God, saying, Pray for us to the Lord, uh, our God, and whatever the Lord, our God, says, tell us so, and we will do it. So I have told you today but you have not obeyed the Lord, your God, even in whatever he has sent me to, to tell you. Therefore, you should now clearly understand that you will die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence in the place where you wish to go to reside. So, Jeremiah, or, or God, already knew what they were going to do. They're not going to listen to me. So they're going to go down there, and, and, and they're, they're going to be destroyed, right? Right? But God said, if you stay, you'll prosper, okay? If you stay, you'll be okay. Uh, now, so don't fear. Just trust in God, and God will take care of you. And, of course, that's, that's our thing, too. We, we, might live, we might live in a culture that we don't like it. God says, trust me, and I'll take care of you. Follow me, and I'll, I'll protect you. Uh, I'll give you everything that you need, right? Now, Jeremiah 43 Jeremiah 43 says, But as soon as Jeremiah, whom the Lord had, their God had sent, had finished telling all the people all the words of the Lord their God, that is, all these words, Azariah, son of Hoshiah, uh, and Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the arrogant men said to Jeremiah, You are telling a lie. The Lord our God has not sent you to say, you are not to enter Egypt to reside there. But uh, B uh, Baruch, the son of Neriah, is inciting you against us to give us over into the, into the hand of the Chaldeans so they will put us to death or exile us to Babylon. So basically they said, no, you're lying to us. Well, that's interesting. Wasn't it them who went to Jeremiah? to ask Jeremiah to pray to God and see what God would say, and now they're calling Jeremiah a liar when they don't get what they want. That, that, that's the way, that's the way a lot, uh, some people are. Oh, I'll serve God as long as he does what I want him to do. 
as long as he does what I think is good, then I'll serve him. But if he doesn't let me do what I want to do, then I'm not going to serve him. And that's basically what you have going on here with what's happening with the remnant of the people that are there. Now, verse 4. So jo Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the co commanders of the forces and all the people did not obey the voice of the Lord to stay in the land of Judah. But Johanan, the son of uh, Korea, and all the, the commanders of the forces took the entire remnant of Judah who had re returned from all the nations to which they had been driven away in order to reside, reside in the land of Judah, the men, the women, the children, the king's daughters, and every person that uh, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the bodyguard, had left with, Gedal with Gedaliah, the son of uh, Ahikam, and grandson of Shaphan, together with Jeremiah the prophet and uh, Baruch the son of Neriah, and they entered the, the land of Egypt, for they did not obey the voice of the Lord and went in as far as Taf, uh, Tahapanese. And so basically, they say, no, we're not going to listen to you. And, and besides that, we're taking you, we're going to kidnap you and you're going to go with us. So they all end up going down there to Egypt. And they're all in Egypt thinking that they're safe and that they're, they're going to be secure. Now, verse 8, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah in uh, Tahapan, uh, Tahapanese, saying, Take some, take some large stones in your hands and hide them in the mortar in the brick terrace, which is at the entrance of Pharaoh's palace in uh, Tehapanese, and uh, in the sight of some of the Jews. And say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I am going to send and get Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and I am going to set his throne right over these stones and I, uh, that I have hidden, and he will spread his canopy over them. In other words, what God is saying is that he's going to come and he's going he's to make his way all the way into the very capital there, and he's going to make that palace his, his um, 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 headquarters. Thank you. He's, he's going to make that place his headquarters for the battle that he's doing there, and he's, he's going to destroy them. He says in verse 11, he will also come and strike the land of, the, of, of Egypt. Those who are meant for death will be given over to death and those for captivity to captivity and those for the sword to the sword. So he says these, these things are going to happen to those, in, to those individuals because they're, they're not obeying the Lord, their God. And, and, and so therefore, those things that happen to them are, are happening because they're not being faithful to God and they're not they're not serving God and they're and they're not doing his will okay all right I lost my place here again thank you I'm, uh, here I am at 11 all right yep um, that's the reason I called you so you can keep me on track uh, all right so he says those who go to captivity to captivity they go and, and those who who go to uh, uh, death to, to death, uh, and so, what he's saying is, if God says that something's going to happen to you, it's going to happen to you. Whether it's you get killed, or whether you go into captivity, or, or whether the, the, the sword gets you, okay? Uh, or, or death gets you. you. You die of old age. God says, whatever I say is going to happen to you is going to happen to you. And th these individuals, they don't understand that about God. And that's the reason they're not following him and, and doing his will. That same, that same statement is found in, Re, in the book of Revelation when God is telling his people that, look, if you're destined for cap captivity, go into captivity. If you're destined for the sword, the sword will, will get you. Or if you're destined to, to die you know, a normal death, you'll die a normal death. In other words, God says, just be faithful to me no matter what happens. And that's what you have going on here, that they're going to be killed. Now, verse 12. And I shall set... And I shall set fire to the temples of the gods of Egypt, and he will burn them and take them captive. So he will wrap himself with the land of Egypt as a shepherd wraps himself with the garment, and he will depart from there safely. He, this is talking about Nebuchadnezzar, he will also shatter the, the uh, obelisks of uh, Helopolis, uh, which is in the land of Egypt, and the temples of the gods of Egypt he will burn with fire. So God had already told, them, told uh, uh, Judah that God was giving the whole area into the hand of Babylon. Babylon was going to become what you and I would call the first world empire 
They were going to become the first world empire. That's who Daniel was going to be living under here, was this first world empire, and they were going to have all of the land. So Egypt wasn't going to, wasn't going to be delivered from them. And then when they went in there, when, the, when Nebuchadnezzar went in there, he killed not only the Egyptians, but he killed all of the uh, Jews that were in there, and especially those people that hadn't obeyed him when they had a chance to live in uh, uh, Judah. And so therefore, that's what you have going on there. Now, back to Jeremiah 25, 27. The reason I want, wanted to go through all that with you was to get you to understand that's why uh, Jerusalem and Judah was barren. Even the poor people, even the poor people were taken captive and they went off into Egypt because they weren't willing to listen. And so now this, the, the land of, of Judah is having its, its rest, God says. God is giving it rest for 70 years, okay? And that's what he has reference to. There's nobody there to take care of it, okay? There might be a few people wandering around there, but there's really nobody to take care of the place because they've been taken captive. Now, back to 2 Kings 25, 27. It says, Now it came about in, in the 37th year of the exile of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, in the 12th month, on the 27th day of the month, that uh, evil uh, Merodach, king of Babylon, in the year that he became king, released Jehoiachin, king of Judah, from prison, and he spoke kindly to him and set his throne above the throne of the kings who were, uh, who were with him in Babylon. And Jehoiachin changed his prison clothes and had his meals in the king's presence regularly all the days of his life. And, and, and for his allowance, a regular allowance was given him by the king, uh, by the king a portion of, for each day, all the days of his life. And so what you see here is all of a sudden you have this guy who's called evil uh, Merodach, who is the king of Babylon, okay? He's, he's one of the kings of Babylon. He came along and he took Jehoiachin. Remember, Jehoiachin was right here. Jehoiachin was this guy right here that he took captive, just before he took Zedekiah captive, right? He, he, he took him captive, uh, and it says that when he was taken captive, that he raised his throne above everybody else's throne, because you remember when he goes and captures the kings, he takes them back to his place. So he's got all these kings in prison. Well, he takes this guy, and he raises him up. He, he, puts, him, he puts him in a position higher than what he was before, and so that always brings us to a question of why did he do that? What, why, why in the world would he do that to him? And the only thing I can do is, is give you a suggestion. Uh, I, I think it's a good suggestion because it's my suggestion. But I, I, I think it's, a, it's a, a good suggestion that if you come over here to the book of Daniel and, and you, you remember over here Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Now, uh, uh, evil Merodach became, uh, was one of the rulers after Nebuchadnezzar. Okay. Now, if you come down here to to, uh, well, I'm, I'm going to start reading for you over here at verse, at verse 46. But what you have going on here in Daniel chapter 2 is you have the vision of the statue. Remember the gold, silver, bronze, and legs of iron? You remember that? And then the, the rock was going to hit it at his feet. It was going to fall, and that rock was going to become a kingdom. And Nebuchadnezzar tried to get his, his magicians, his soothsayers, his diviners, his wise men to interpret it, but they couldn't interpret it. So who does he call? He calls Daniel, right? So he calls Daniel, and when he calls Daniel, Daniel interprets a dream for him. And then in verse 27, uh, I'm sorry, verse 46 of Daniel 7, it says, Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and did homage to Daniel and gave orders to 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 pre uh, to present to him an offering in fragrant incense. The king answered Daniel and said, "Surely your God is a God of gods and a Lord and a Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, since you have been able to reveal this mystery." 
Then, then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many gr great gifts, and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. And Daniel made requests of the king, and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the administration of the province of, of Babylon while Daniel was at the king's court. So now all of a sudden you're starting to see that, that Babylon is starting to understand that the God of the Jews is different than the gods of the other kings that they have that they have in prison and they have arrested. So I, I suggest to you that the reason that that um, Jehoiachin was raised up above the other rulers was because he was the only Jewish king that was there that was alive, and therefore he raised him up because. His God, Jehovah Chim's God, is greater than any other God. And so it's interesting that that's the very last thing that we find in 2 Kings 25 is that even though the Jews themselves didn't recognize the importance of God, Babylon did, and Nebuchadnezzar did, and the kings did, until you get that one guy who comes along and he becomes king and he... He doesn't value God, and he drinks from his bowl, and then you have the handwriting on the wall. Remember that story? But Nebuchadnezzar and the people who followed him, the kings who followed him, they had respect for the God of the Jews. And I'd suggest to you that that's why, along with the fact that a little bit later on, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got thrown in the fire. Daniel got thrown into the lion's den. And so there was a de decree made that you're not supposed to speak against the God of the Jews. And so I'd suggest to you that's the reason why. And so what it shows us is, is that the Gentile world is more e easily uh, convinced of God's position than God's own people were. So any thoughts or questions then? All right, uh, let me go ahead and hand you out your papers for next, the next study, which is going to be in this class on the Holy Spirit. And I'll tell you a couple things I want you to do before class <coughs> next week. Because, of course, if you fold it in half, it turns into a little booklet. You don't fold it in half, it's a big booklet. There you go. Well, it's a book, so it has to be closed. You can put it in your little sleeve there. There we go. There we go. And here you go. Now, this, this study is going to be more of an interactive study. In other words, you guys are going to have to do some stuff rather than just listen. Not that you didn't do stuff before, but it's going to require a little bit more uh, that goes on there. So I need you to do some stuff for me for the very first class. I need you to do something for me. I want you to turn in your little booklets to page uh, two or four and five. Page four and five in there, it says class expectations for the study of the Holy Spirit. It's got some questions. It says, what are you expecting from this class? It says, what concepts about the Holy Spirit are you hoping that we cover? And then what passages about the Holy Spirit do you hope are covered in the study? Now, the reason I'm giving you that is because I want to make sure that I answer all the questions that you guys have. Instead of me just going over stuff that I think is important, I want you to tell me, you know, I was hoping we would cover, you know, the laying on of hands. Or I was hoping we would cover uh, tongues. Or I was hoping we would cover whatever. I want to make sure that, that we covered. Or... You know, I, I, I don't understand uh, uh, the, the verse where Jesus breathes on the disciples, the, the Holy Spirit. So I want you to make sure and write down what it is that you think we're, that you would like to cover so that uh, I can know exactly what to cover. Uh, and then if you notice, as you go through the pages, there's a lot of blank stuff. That blank stuff is for you to fill in. Like if you take a look at page 8, Okay, take a look at page eight. There's all that, all those blanks. There's a little question, all those blanks. So just read the verses and fill those in. If you don't have time to do that, I know you're busy. The first thing I want you to do, even before you do this, is what? Read your Bible. You should be reading your Bible every day. If you don't have time to, to read your Bible and do this, just read your Bible. That's more important than doing this. If you have time to read your Bible and you have extra time, then do this in here. 
Okay. But for next week, make sure you at least do the first couple of pages so that I can get a good idea of what it is that you want to cover. And then we'll be covering the Holy Spirit in this class. Uh, any questions or thoughts anybody has or anything you want to tell me or let me know? Don't lose the book. The next one's I'm going to charge you a dollar a piece for. Cheap, I know. Okay, inflation, $2. All right, let's have ourselves a prayer. Lord God and Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you have recorded for us the history of your people. So not only do we see how we act, Father, and what we need to correct in our lives, but we see how gracious and kind you are, Father, to us. That even when we sin and even when we don't do what's right, if we repent and turn to you, you promise to take care of us. We pray that you would help us to always serve you and glorify you in everything that we do. Pray that you forgive us for our sins, that you keep us from uh, temptation and deliver us from the evil one. And we pray, Father, that no matter what happens in our life, whether sword or famine or pestilence or whatever, that we remain faithful to you in all that we do. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.